Welcome to Grounded. Today we are going to study 2 Nephi, chapters 11 through 19. We're going to focus specifically on the writings of Isaiah. We're going to look at three main areas, the context, the tools, and the application. And within all of this, we are going to have a special focus on hope in Jesus Christ. Welcome to Grounded, where women of all ages, nationalities, and backgrounds gather together with me, Barbara Morgan Gardner, and my guest, as we strive to build a bedrock understanding of the life and teachings of Jesus Christ and become more like Him. Today, to help us understand Isaiah better, we have our wonderful friend, Lori Denning. Lori, it's so good to have you here. I'm so happy to be here. Okay, good. It's because we're doing Isaiah. Okay, I wondered. Okay. I mean, it, it is the best one. You yes. saved the best for me. Well, y yes, we really have. Yeah, okay. Elder Eyring actually talks about how Isaiah is difficult. But before we get into Isaiah and you helping us get there, through there, President Nelson has reminded us of three important identities. Number one, that we are children of God. Number two, that we are children of the covenant. And number three, that we're disciples of Jesus Christ. So in addition to those things, will you help us to know something about you and what's unique about you? Oh, that's thanks. Yes, I am super unique, except I'm not. I'm a twin, so I have an identical <laughs> twin. So if you see somebody walking around with longer hair, that's my twin. So it's probably a good one. Um, I, I have yeah, actually seen you have, her walking around. You have, around, actually, yeah. yeah. So, but if someone else and you're like, hey, they don't answer to Lori, it's my twin. Say hi to Lisa. Uh, I am from San Diego, and I used to race dirt bikes, so I love things that 14-year-old boys love, including Star Wars and Lord of the Rings as well. Uh, so, yeah, and let's see, what else? Served a mission in Barcelona, Spain, oh, so I nice. speak Spanish. Uh, and I'm a PhD. Hey, Muy bien. Muy bien, except in Spain, they speak another language, oh, Catalan. Right. Yeah, yeah. yeah, so they taught us uh, Spanish in the MTC, and then I ended up having to go there and learn another language, Catalan, which nobody speaks. And then I am currently a PhD student in Hebrew Bible or Old Testament. So I study the Old Testament for fun, uh, just finishing up my PhD now at Claremont Graduate University. Well, great job. Lori, you talked about the Hebrew Bible. And one of the things that we recognize is that for many people, Isaiah is a little bit confusing. In fact, President Eyring has said, I have worried about the barrier of Isaiah. He continues, I have pondered this thought, why did Nephi put the barrier there? So that is a very interesting way of introducing all of us to Isaiah. But then he says this, he says, many are more skilled than I am at putting scriptures in their historical context. These are wonderful techniques of understanding metaphor, simile, and allegory in the scriptures. And I hope you will learn as much as you can. So, so Lori, for most of us, you know, I think we may be a little bit more like President Eyring, where he's saying it's maybe a little bit of a barrier. And we want to be grounded in the scriptures. We don't want to just skip it. We, we don't want to feel as some may that the Lord put it there so that we could stop reading the Book of Mormon. You don't you want know? to get to second Nephi and skip ahead. Right, exactly. Yeah. Elder Holland talked about it would have been nice if he put the Nephi killing Laban in the Isaiah chapter <laughs> so nobody knew about it. You know, that kind of thing. <laughs> But we also recognize that there is a point of likening the scriptures to us, and there are also those like you who really do understand Isaiah and that can help us through this. So would you help us start like, with the context, if that's okay, and yeah. then help us so that we are more grounded in the gospel and so that we are more confident in our ability to teach others as well? Yeah, I would love to. Thanks. Thanks. You know, I think the first thing to notice is, is it is hard. It's harder. Um, sometimes growing up, I always felt like I should be getting it by now. But it does take a few tips and tricks or some historical context and things to learn it. So if I think the first thing to approach is if you come to the Isaiah sections and you say, really, I've been doing this my whole life. Or I've been doing it a couple of times and I still don't get it. That's OK. That's normal. Uh, and but if you've done it 50 times, <laughs> still normal. OK, still hard. Okay, good. Still hard. Um, and there's a great scene in the end of Third Nephi that actually elaborates this. So I'm going to paraphrase a little, but the Savior has come down to the new world. He's appeared to them at the, at the Temple of Bountiful, and he's speaking to them for a couple of days. And then he's speaking, he's quoting Isaiah. And then he stops, almost mid-sentence. This is Third Nephi 16. And it, he stops and he goes, I, I perceive that you don't understand a word I'm saying. So I want you to go home. I want you to pray. I want you to focus on the Savior, ponder what we've been studying. And then when he comes back tomorrow, we're going to talk about it. And he starts with the sacrament. So he renews that covenant, getting closer to him. So even those people were like, wait, what? So 
Great little aside, thanks Dr. Joe Spencer for teaching me that. But if you ever feel like you didn't get it, that's okay, they didn't either. <laughs> In fact, that's one of my favorite scriptures is of, of Third Nephi is when he's asking them. I love this. He says, therefore, go into your homes and ponder upon the things which I have said. Ask of the Father in my name that you may understand and prepare your mind for the morrow and I come unto you again. I mean, it's just beautiful. beautiful. Yeah. And I think it's a, a key that we need to do. Go home, ponder the things that the Lord has said, the things you already know about the Savior. Uh, pray to the Father that you'll understand them. And then uh, right after that, when they come back, participates in the sacrament. So I think there's something there. We're renewing our covenants, becoming closer to the Spirit that will help us understand these. But I think what it teaches us is it is hard. Yeah. And that's okay. Yeah. But good news, we're going to give you a little bit of context. So Okay, let's get it. Okay, let's do it. Yep. All right, so the first thing to remember is think about where Nephi, I think, is coming from. So this is Isaiah in the Book of Mormon. It's not the Old Testament. So for Nephi, remember, he grew up uh, learning some of these things about scriptures, but he didn't always understand this. And so when he comes across to the New World, by the time he's writing this, it's like 30 to 40 years later. So as he's writing that, he's thinking back and he's thinking, what can I include? And in fact, he starts here in the beginning of 11 saying, well, now Jacob, he gave, yeah. remember Jacob gives Jacob the conference talk. Like Jacob's like, I didn't want to talk about this, but Nephi assigned it. So I guess I'm going to talk on it. Then Nephi picks it back up and says, okay, now I'm going to really teach you. I think what's important about that is he's picking certain things for us that he wants to understand, but it's the same way he understood. Yeah. When we come out of first Nephi, think of him as young Nephi. He didn't always know what was going on. His dad takes him out of town. All those things we've just been reading about, right? It's action-packed. But he has those visions. He wants to know Lehi's vision. He wants to know his own vision. And now he's started to understand the Lord for himself. And in that, he says, these things about Isaiah are the same things. So the things that you, we've been learning in first Nephi are the same things that he wants us to look for. He wants us to say, I just learned about the Savior. I learned that he's the Redeemer. I learned that he can help my family. And he's worried, Nephi is worried about his own family. Right. Right. He's, we see this theme, right? We, we see, see it with theme. Jacob, we see it with Lehi, now we see it with Nephi. Yeah. It's a family. Yeah, it's a family. So he's worried about Laman and Lemuel. He's worried about his own family. He's worried about his nieces and nephews. Yep. He's worried about Zoram. He's worried about everybody. And that is our story, Barb. Yep, yeah. I think that the Lord has set this up for us to say, I'm in a family and I have ups and downs. I know that Christ is the Redeemer. And then what else am I supposed to learn? And with that context, we go in. Right? Yeah. And you know, another part of this, Lori, that I think is very interesting, and, and this maybe is talked about so often, but in, in chapter 11... I love where, and you're talking about this older Nephi, right? And yeah. we're also an older Jacob at this point. Yeah. So, and, but I love, and, we, and this almost has become so common, but he says, and now I, Nephi, write more of the words of Isaiah, for my soul delighteth in his words. For I will liken his words unto my people, and I will send them forth unto all my children. For he verily saw my Redeemer, even as I have seen him. And I, I love that we're talking about Isaiah see, has seen him. Nephi has seen him. And I know that we say this often, and now my brother Jacob also has seen him as I have seen him. These are, these are no longer, this isn't, this isn't the Nephi of 1 Nephi 3, 7, who was trying to, you know, have a softened heart. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> now he has seen the Savior, and there is a whole different level of responsibility that has come to Nephi. Yeah. I think, Barb, that is a perfect key. And they start this chapter 11 telling us that, because I think they want, Nephi is picking this particularly. I, I see, I imagine him sitting, going, I'm worried about my family. I see what's going to happen in the future. What do I tell yeah. them? What yeah. do I tell them? And so he says, I'm going to tell them this. So when we take that first context and we overlay it into what we're going to read next, or if we get lost, yeah. come back and say, he's teaching us Christ is the savior. He's the redeemer. And then we come back and that helps. Even Absolutely. though you're like, I'm not really sure how this works. You're like, that's okay. Check, right? But it helps us to see what's important to him. It, it right? is. It does. Yeah. He could have said other things too, and he's quoting Isaiah. So yeah. 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 So that's where how we're going to start to okay. understand his context. And one more trick there. This is how we can understand in our lives. Okay. So I'm worried about my family. I'm worried about, but I do know these things. I know that Christ is the Redeemer, and I I want to learn more. I want to show this to them, or I want to enliven this in myself again. We go. Hmm. That's what he's kind of hoping for. We get out. 
So he didn't just pick and choose every historical right. episode, right? If you went back and read Isaiah in the Old Testament, he'd have all this other stuff about all these other people and trade wars and politics. And he's like, I, 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 luckily he took that out. As hard as it is, at least <laughs> yeah. he took that part out. Yeah. Um, but he is going to tell us that. So that context, I think, is super helpful. Whenever you get stuck, rewind, jump in and go, hmm. And if you can't remember where that is, it's Second Nephi 11. And that's where you yeah. just read. And, and to your point, this part of this talk, this is a talk called um, The Book of Mormon Will Change Your Life by President Eyring. Okay. So this first part is what you're telling us. Understand the context, understand the tools, understand the imagery, everything else. But then he also says, I learned one more thing. As you read Isaiah in the Book of Mormon, try to believe that Nephi knew Isaiah and he knew imagery. Nephi said to liken Isaiah directly unto you, so I tried it. And then he continues, imagine that he tried it, right? I read Isaiah's words again, assuming Nephi picked the parts of Isaiah that I, without worrying about the imagery, could take directly to my heart as if the Lord were speaking to me. And I think that's also my invitation as you go through, you having this scholarly ability, mm -hmm. but also us looking at it and saying, what, what do I need today to learn from Isaiah? What do I need as, as a mother, as a teacher, as a, as, as a community member, whatever, what can I take from Isaiah right now? Yeah. And how do I better understand and how do I use these tools for that purpose? But Isaiah is writing for, for others. Nephi is writing for others. And we need to pay attention, like you're saying, we have a family. Yeah. We have a community. We, we are living today, here and now, and it still is written for us. Yeah, that's right. Let's talk about those motifs, those symbols, the poetry and things. Because that's it. part of it that I think that makes it hard. So yep. let's talk about that. For sure. Let's talk about some tools. So one of the things that's really helped me, and it was like a super surprise, shocker, when I learned this later, um, it's written as a poem, like 99% of it. So poetry was always something I kind of stuck away from. Like when I was in high school, I was like, I just want to do the story part. So um, it's because you like Star Wars, right? I do like Star Wars, but let okay. me use another nerdy example. Okay, okay. Um, Lord of the Rings. So if you think of the movies or like The Hobbit, they like break out into song all the time, right? Those are poems in the okay. um, in the book. And when I was a kid, I would read it and it would just skip past the poetry part. And then I would get back to the story because I was like back to sword fighting yeah. or whatever, right? And, and now I realize that the song or the poem is the is the story is like hmm. the heart of it and and so one of the reasons that Isaiah used poetry and not the poetry we think of but like ancient Hebrew poetry we'll talk about that in a second yeah because we need to understand, we what, to that understand what that means okay but let's talk about why what it was and why I used it and then I'll show you how to okay. pick it up because yep. it's not very hard to pick up once I show you the trick okay so poetry think of it like like Lord of the Rings or think of it like the most important things that have ever happened in your life. So just take a second, like, what are the most important things? The most emotional, the most impactful times in my life. They might be a little bit hard to describe. They might be a little bit hard to really get the emotion into and really capture. In fact, Brigham Young talks about how pen, he just, the English language and the pen does not have the ability to describe those kinds of things. He just couldn't do it. Okay. Right? Yeah. So think about those moments, the things that are set apart, the things that are hard to capture where heaven and earth are combined for a moment. Think about when the announcement of Jesus' birth to the uh, the shepherds. Yeah. What happens? The sky tears open and the angel hosts of heaven burst into song. Yeah. You know, they're not like clapping along. I mean, it's glory to God in the highest, right? So these moments of the deepest holiness, the most emotion, the most spirit and earth to combined are a song. Hmm. And so when Isaiah is trying to convey the most meaningful parts, he's not just going to tell a story, oh, there was this time. He is going to put it in a poem. But I think it's one of the places, especially maybe as women, that we can really knock Isaiah out of the park, right, is really get it, is that we can get in touch with that intent and that feeling and that spiritual connectedness. We might not understand the historical stuff without doing our homework, but we can understand those feelings. Yeah. And so I think that's where we can say, look, as women or men who are really looking at their the emotional and the spiritual connection in those moments, we connect with the spirit, we connect with Isaiah, we connect with what Nephi is trying to tell us, and that's why it's in a poem, hmm. is so that we can connect on a level that's spiritual, a level that's more. Hebrew poetry is not like English poetry, and so English poetry you think of as like it rhymes, right? Yeah. And if you look at it on a page, it looks different, right? So when you look at your scriptures, 
Can you spot any poems in there just glancing at it? You know, I wouldn't think so. No, you can't. No. When we put it into chapters and verses, you can't see it. Right. So one of the tips and tricks I want to show you is try it on a different translation. Okay. That someone set it apart so you can kind of see that it's in poem. Yeah. So they'll indent it and they'll put it together. And then you're like, hey, this is a poem. <laughs> and so uh, you can go online and you can just try different Bible translations. You'd have to go to Isaiah, in this case, to do it. Um, but you can try that, and it helps because once you notice it, you're like, whoa, this is a poem. And here's what you have to do with poem. Before you go yeah, there, where, yeah. where, where, what do you recommend? I mean, mm. is the NJ, what are, we, what, are we, what are we trying to look yeah, at like, here? Yeah, I like two tools. Okay. So there's BibleHub.com okay. yep. and BibleGateway.com. And, and BibleGateway has English and Spanish. Oh, that's great. Um, and so you can look up Isaiah 6, which would be 2 Nephi 16, okay. right? So I just subtract the 10 as the trick, and then I know what chapter it is. Um, and then I can go in there and I can see that it's in a poem. And so once I see that, then I go, oh. Also, what you can do in there is you can click on a different translation. We're in King James version right. in English, um, Reina Valera in Spanish. Right. That was for my Spanish speakers. And then, uh, but you could try something. I like the new revised standard, and it's got some other initials at the end. Or you could do something really simple that's just the meaning, something like contemporary English hmm. version. Okay. Here's the biggest trick. Okay. Start with a different translation, and it's about 50% easier. Okay. And we're done. That, no. So, that's very helpful. But, no, but if you. you start with a different translation, you get rid of that like Shakespearean-sounding language that yeah. King James has, and it just is clearer. Okay. It just makes it 100% clearer. So okay. Got it. Start there. And if you're like, oh, now I get it, read it there, and then bounce back. And you can get all those online. So we yeah, don't have free. to go and nope, buy some new set of scriptures. We can do it, especially as we're trying to prepare you try to prepare a lesson, okay. or you get to a section that you're like, I kind of understood it, but I'm not sure what it means. Bounce out to one of those. Read it there. And then you're like, oh, why didn't he just say it that way? Well, he probably did. But again, this is 2,500 years later. And so okay. our language. So that's the first trick. That Thank you. Yep, tool. that's good. Okay. Next. Here's another thing about poetry. Hebrew poetry, we rhyme. They don't rhyme in words like sounds, right? Like mm -hmm. one fish, two fish, red fish, blue fish. They rhyme in ideas. So they're short sentences, and they rhyme the two, they'll put at least two ideas together. So the two ideas will rhyme. Okay. Hebrew doesn't have a really big vocabulary, so they say the same thing over and over, and they that's kind of how they impact hmm. it. Interesting. So it's kind of like um, I uh, the Lord's word is the best, right? The the word His word is the best. His uh, scriptures are a lamp to my feet, right? You'll see those where it's right. like, I did something with word. I did something with scriptures. I did something with the mountain of the Lord's house, the temple of the something, right? Um, sinful people, iniquitous people, good, good, bad, bad, yeah. something like that, right? So you'll see them in these little two packs coming over and over. Sometimes they're the same. I mean, sometimes they're the opposite, but what they're doing is keeping those little rhymey couplets, those little doubles and triples together. Right. So you're going to go into this, but I just want to just kind of yeah. show. So Let's if we're it. looking at chapter 12, mm -hmm. I mean, just kind of take us into the scripture a little bit. Mm -hmm. I, I mean, I think you're where you're one going or two. is verses one and two, yeah. right? That's what you're talking yeah. here. Yeah, so, reinforce. Okay, so the word that Isaiah, the son of Amos, saw concerning Judah and Jerusalem. And it shall come to pass, this is verse two, in the last days when the mountain of the Lord's house shall be established in the top of the mountains. And shall be exalted above the hills, and all nations shall flow unto it. Yeah. And then you see verse three continuing, mm -hmm. and many people shall go and say, "Come ye, and let us go up to the mountain of the Lord, to the house of God, the house of the God of Jacob." I mean, just there you see exactly what you're saying. The temple, the mountain. They're going up to it. Then there's an add to the people are going to flow, and then the people are going to say, "Yep." They're walking the pathways. They're is, walking yeah. the path. They're going up the hill. Yeah. So you, when you read it as a English speaker, you're like, it's kind of repetitive and awkward, but if you think of it trying to do that, it's trying to tell you probably at least two things, if not three things, yeah. before then you'll see it. Let me show you another trick. Okay. Go back one chapter, okay? because um, there's a poem in 11, so even our friend Nephi does it in 11, and it was the phrase you said, so one place to find is repetitiveness. When you find a phrase that's repeating, okay. it might be a poem. So I'm going to read four through six, okay. and I want you to s just count in your head how many times you hear that. Okay. Behold, my soul delighteth in proving unto my people the truth of the coming of Christ. For, for this end hath the law of Moses been given, and all things which have been given of God from the beginning of the world unto man are typifying of him. 
And also, my soul delighteth in the covenants of the Lord, which he hath made to our fathers. Yea, my soul delighteth in his grace and his justice and his power and his mercy and the great and eternal plan of deliverance from death. And my soul delighteth in proving unto my people that save Christ should come. All men must perish. Did yeah. you catch him? Yeah, absolutely. And he's emphasizing what he's saying. So the first delight is he's, he loves, he delights in proving unto his people the truth of the coming of the Christ. Then he delights in the covenants of the Lord. Then he delights in Christ's grace, mercy, and justice and power. And then he delights in proving unto the people that save Christ should come, all men must perish. So different ways of seeing it, but still. He starts it yeah. every time. My soul delighteth in something you're supposed to really. remember. Yeah. My soul delighteth in something I'm supposed to remember. My soul delighteth. Okay. Right? So even Nephi is doing it. It's yes. like, hey, it. so when you see those repetitive things, remember he's trying to show something. So what do we do with it when we see it, right? One is notice it. Two, see what they're trying to say. Slow down. If all you got to was 2 Nephi 11, 4 through 6, outstanding. Yeah. Because this stuff is dense. You're going to want to think about it. You're going to ponder what they're trying to say. See how that relates in your own life. Okay. So we've kind of learned it's hard. Yep. Don't feel bad if it is. There are some tools remembering where Nephi came from. He's worried about his family. He wants to testify of Christ. He wants us to remember our covenants. We didn't touch on that one, but he's going to go through that in 2 yeah. Nephi. Okay. Morning. So we're going to go through those. Then the techniques that he uses, the tools he uses, is this crazy poetry stuff. You're right. So we all kind of probably know poetry and we certainly know symbols and metaphors and things because we're human. And so we do that all the time. Right. So he's going to use plants and, and some of these things. Right. 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 But there is one other theme that he's going to go through. Okay. So he's going to go through the theme of hope, hope, okay. hope, hope. So there's always this little judgment going on. And, and certainly in Isaiah's time, they were in trouble, right? There were the two kingdoms. They're always in trouble. The northern kingdom gets sucked off by the Assyrians. And it's just about to happen to the south. It's right when Nephi's family leaves. So it's like, how did we get so in trouble? In our personal lives or in Nephi's life, he's like, I got these two brothers, right? I got these two brothers and they're not doing so great. In our own lives, it might be us that's not doing so great. Or we have moments that aren't doing so great. So... We're going to read this idea of judgment, like things aren't going great. Well, it's interesting too with this. I mean, we're talking, we've already, last week we talked about how Nephi had to leave his family. Mm -hmm. I mean, he has those who are righteous, but now we also see Jacob just recently who is basically calling the people to repentance. So even the most <laughs> righteous that are left, I mean, it's like Nephi leaves the wicked okay. back in Jerusalem. Then he has to leave him again, his family. Now he has his own family. He has his brother talk about the anxiety that he's feeling for these for these people, people. that are left. And then Nephi still, still is dealing problems. with this. Oh, well, that's good news because we are too. I know. Surprise, surprise. Surprise, right? surprise. Yeah. So if it's ever like, hey, I'm feeling pretty down on myself or I have problems in my family or people about the church or my job is tr tricky or whatever, he's going, this story's for you. And that's where his other theme comes in. If there's okay. judgment, he just says there's hope. And the hope has a name. Yeah. His name is Jesus. And so when we come back to Christ, we're going to understand. So in every one of these verses, you might find judgment. He's going to describe the naughtiness or the badness that's going on. You can just insert your own challenges there. Yep. And then he's going to say, what do I do with him? What do I do with him? Now, he's going to do all of those things in almost every one of these chapters. Right. Okay? Yep. So let's jump, to, okay. to, let's jump to 16. Okay. Because I want to do... Um, the story that you just told about them seeing the Savior is so critical, and there's just a quick story, and I'm going to summarize it. But I want us to read a little bit, and then I want to summarize. Perfect. So in um, 2 Nephi 16, again, remember, these are little chunks. You can't read them like a storybook. You're going to have to take not even the whole chapter, but chunks of the chapter and kind of see what he's saying. So if you blow right through, you don't get everything, that's okay. But slow down every once in a while and, and grab a little okay. a little section. Yep. So in this one, he's starting with this idea and he goes, oh yeah, there was this, he's telling his own story. This is why I love this. This is Isaiah's own story. And he says, you know, in the year when that king died, um, I saw this. Let's read it. He said, I saw also the Lord sitting upon a throne, high and lifted up, and his train filled the temple. So what's he saying? He's seeing, he was in the temple, and he looks up and he sees the Lord where? 
In the temple. In the temple. Yeah. And what else he dri- describes this other thing going on. And he said, and it says, train filled the temple. I'm going to go over to the contemporary English version. I had a vision of the Lord and he was on his throne high above and his robe filled the temple. There you go. Like, oh, his train, right? Like right. you think of like your wedding train. Right. right. So his, he's up there and it's like all the way down. God's up here in his throne and all the way down here I see this, this flowing thing. Right. Then he goes on to describe these angelic beings and they're kind of freaky, right? They've got, they've got um, wings and they're and all this, but they're around the throne. And it right. seems like anytime we show up to the temple and where the Lord is, there are angelic guardians, right? Absolutely. Right. So they're there and they're like, holy, holy, holy. So that's what they say. Holy, holy, holy. And I'm still in the contemporary English. Lord, all powerful. The earth is filled with your glory. Holy, holy, holy. And that, so he sees something. And by yeah. the way, that's a poem. Holy, 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 Lord, all powerful. The Lord, earth is filled with your glory. That's what they're saying. They're, they're singing it. They're singing it. So we've already learned there are times in our lives when it's hard to link the spiritual. And here's a poem. And here's our first one. So I'm just going to bring this to, I mean, we talked about that one experience of being holy, just like you, just like you mentioned, and the robes of the temple. Okay. This, this is something, and I'm just going to take it now and apply it here. I, one of my, if you were to ask my my oldest daughter, Allie, of all of the moments in her life that she thinks are, is most poignant, it is the day that she was sealed to Dustin and I. It, it was, we were driving to the temple. It was, it was, this is so real for us, driving to the temple and Allie asking, you know, what does this mean? She was six. Like, what, what is really happening here? She, she, she'd had a, a hard little life up to this point. And and being adopted and also being abandoned, she she struggled with recognizing that what we were doing was very significant to her. And in that moment of us driving, she asked a question at one point. And she just said, "How do I know? How, how do I know that you aren't going to leave me? How do I know that when we have this feeling, that 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 this is real?" And Dustin and I had the most beautiful experience being able to just testify her to her that it was because in the temple, we were going to put on the robes of the holy priesthood and we were going to make a covenant with our Father in heaven and Jesus Christ and we were going to tell them and in a sense each other and her that she would never be left. Mm. And, and in that moment, I mean, you're talking about these robes and things that you can't really explain. There's no way to explain what it's like to kneel across the altar with your husband and two little children's hands on your hands and then having them be completely dependent upon the covenants you're making in their minds, Mm -hmm. but also testifying so strongly that because of this covenant, there's a reason that we're saying, we're crying, holy, holy, holy is the Lord of hosts and the whole earth is full of his glory. And there's a reason why we can go on, the post of the door moved the voice of him with him that cried. I mean, we're talking holy, holy, holy for Allie. You ask her any time, what is the most holy and sacred experience and the most joyful experience of your life? It's the moment we knelt across the altar as a family and promised her that she would never be left again. But the most important part of that is, again, that focus on Christ. As you said, the hope is in Christ. The hope's not in us because we are not always going to be there. But she understood in that day that Christ was, Ah. you know, the temple is. It's all centered in Christ. I I also loved, though, what you said because I think that's what covenants are is just what Ali said. We covenant with the Lord and now we know he will never leave us. Yeah. Right? We might drift away. But that's what a covenant is, right? I, he's promising, no matter how bad it gets, you guys, I am never going to leave you. Right. And that's what she picked up out of it, too. Yeah. Right? I'm never going to leave you. Isaiah goes through the same experience. He's The Lord shows up. He's like, whoa. And then he says, whoa. I He realizes how different he is than the Lord, how holy the Lord is and how he's at. Yeah. And he, he's like, I am unworthy. And then the angelic being goes over to the uh, altar. He takes a coal and he's like, I am a man of unclean lips. Right. It's very poetic, right? Yeah, yeah. I am, I am unclean. I am not worthy to be here. This, I don't belong here. This is crazy. And the Lord could just wipe him out. And what it does instead, it puts the coal on his lips and you think it could burn him. Yeah. And instead it purifies him. And that's that judgment and hope. And that's Allie, right? I'm so worried and yet, the Lord will never leave me, uh, even when I fall. And, and so those themes, they're right here. 
They're right here the whole time. And so uh, Nephi is giving us the story. So we say, look, Isaiah's story in the temple of feeling unpure, of seeing the Lord, of coming closer is the same thing for us. We can see him. We can covenant with him. We can be one with him and be purified, that judgment, and I can have hope in my life. Okay, Lori, I'm going to take you to a personal realm. Okay. <laughs> that makes me nervous. I told you I don't like vulnerable I, things. I know, but you are so good. I love this moment. Okay. When have you known, as you're talking here, I mean, I just told you a story of Ali. I've yeah. told you a story of myself, but when have you really felt this holy, holy? Where, when have you really felt hope in Jesus Christ? Mm. When have you been able to resonate? Because you studied this. I mean, you studied this as a scholar, and, which is fantastic. When have you <laughs> felt this, it's almost this this sacred moment? Yeah, this moment. Um I think we all have a few of those, and, and so thank you if for asking. If it's not too sacred, no, I, mean, no, no, I, mean, I want to be cautious of that too. Yeah. Um, but there was once, I, and it was when I decided to go back to school, right? Because I'm an older person, and so we call that a returning student. And I was driving to work, and I'm an executive in business, so I've been doing that for decades at this point. I'm old. And... I'm driving to work and I'm doing the old, like... Okay, you're this, not old, by the way. I just I want am, to clarify for everybody who's listening and can't see you that you're I, not, but I'm go old, ahead. I, I am gorgeous, but you, <laughs> old. No, no. But I, you know, I'd already had a whole career, I guess is my point. And, and, and it was a fairly, it's been a fairly successful career and I've, I've enjoyed it. But I'm driving to work thinking, is this really what my life is? Is my life really just I wake up and go to work and do some job that I can hardly describe five years from now what I was doing, right? Yeah. Just some business thing. And I was having a, a very sincere prayer in traffic driving. And I am not a person, Barb, that has, you know, miracles of visions every five minutes, like very rare. And I, I just said to the Lord, Lord, what am I supposed to do with my life? And and I'm single. I, I've never been married. I don't have any kids. So for me, I don't have any legacy. I don't have anything like that, that, that I'm like, well, you know, at least my kids. I'm like, I got this business job I got. So as I'm having that kind of existential crisis, I said, Lord, what, what am I supposed to do with my life? And as clear as day, I, I kind of feel this question, like, well, what are you good at? Hmm. And I'm like, well, see, I did triathlon for a while. I'm not very good at that. And I'm just like having, I'm just in a, in a second, right? My mind goes through all these things that I've tried. I'm good at business. I, I guess I'm good at this other thing. And um, I said, I, I don't, I guess it sounds a little dumb, but Lord, I'm pretty good at interpreting scriptures. He said, follow me. Wow. And I knew. And it was, it was profound for me. And that moment is a moment that I knew that I needed to do. And I knew when I was asking that it was time to change. So I went back to school. That's a huge change. I went back to school and did an undergrad, a master's degree, and now I'm finishing a PhD. And the Lord has led me every step of the way. And, and so I think it's like, oh, Isaiah, your story is pretty powerful. Mine's just as powerful for me. It absolutely is. And I, I feel, as you're talking about in verse 6, this live coal, this purifying moment that he's having. And then verse 7, and he laid it upon my mouth and said, Lo, this has touched thy lips, and thy iniquity is taken away, and thy sin purged. And then we see that example of Christ that you were mentioning already in, in chapter 16, mm -hmm. but now in verse 8. Also, I heard the voice of the Lord saying, Whom shall I send? And who will go for us? Then I said, Here am I, send me. What, what, what is this? I mean, it seems like it's so obvious. We know the pre-mortal world. Is, mm -hmm. is that what's going on here, Lori? Is that what you think? Or what? Yeah, we see it over and over again. I think the Lord is saying, now that you've felt and tasted of his redeeming love, now that you've had this, you've met the Redeemer, whether it's in prayer, whether it's an experience in the temple, whether it's in baptism, whether it's in traffic. Yeah. He says, okay, I've got a mission for you, Lori and Barb and you. And yep. then you say, here I am. Send me, I'm ready. Yeah. And, and for me, he said, go back to school. For you, it might be, you know, make a cake for your neighbor or work on that anger issue. <laughs> no, you yeah, got, right? Well, or yes, it actually, is. that's true. But, but I remember I'll be, you know, I had a driving moment too, Lori. Okay. Oh, I didn't know this was going to be revelation. I, I didn't either, but here we go. It's okay. like the car okay. moment. It was, it was speaking of our, our girls. I was driving to work and 
I had always assumed that when I became a mom, if I ever did become a mom, that I would, that I would quit my job, quit everything, and be a full-time mother. And I remember struggling to know if we should adopt these little girls in this moment. My husband knew immediately. It took me a little bit. As I was driving to work, it wasn't, this wasn't the time that I received the confirmation of adopting the girls, but the confirmation I did receive was, do not quit your job. Which, Lori, it was against everything that I had planned. The moment I had children, I was going to be a stay-at-home mom and put 100% attention into those girls. The opposite happened to me. I was driving to work and it was. How did you feel? I thought I should have felt confused, Mm -hmm. but in reality, I felt clear. Mm -hmm. The Lord has spoken. I don't understand. This is against what I wanted to do, but I will continue to work. I love my job. I love teaching youth. I love the gospel. I love the scripture. So part of me was happy, but part of me was so, but it wasn't, it wasn't confusion because I knew that it was from God. Mm -hmm. I knew that he had spoken, but it was different. Yes. Yes. And, and honestly, it could have been a poem moment for me too, because, Mm -hmm. you know, I have seven sisters. (laughs) They all left their work when they had children. They all stayed home. My mom was a full-time home. I mean, she was a hard worker. She was incredible. But for me, that, that moment was, you need to keep working. And I didn't know how I was going to do it, Lori. In all honesty, I had no idea. And the miracle for this was just a couple months later, the girls moved in and COVID hit. And I was at home with my girls 24 seven, continuing my job, working online with my students and helping them understand a little bit more about the atonement of Jesus Christ while I got to know, yeah. while Dustin and I, my husband and I got to know our own little family. Yeah. Fantastic. Thank you. Yeah. So, so Lori, we've talked context. Mm-hmm. You've helped us with some of these tools. This has been fantastic mm-hmm. to understand some of these mm-hmm. things. Are there more tools that you'd like to express? And also before you do, I appreciate your continued focus on Jesus Christ and bringing us back into the scriptures. Yep. Because sometimes we can get into Isaiah and forget <laughs> the scriptures, but I appreciate that we're keep, we're, keep we, are, back. we are bringing it back yeah. to, the, to the word of God here. Yeah. So thank you. And to Christ himself as the center of all of this. Yeah, they're trying to explain this complicated, but not that complicated, simple concept of Christ right, right. in our lives. Right. Another thing that Isaiah does that I think we can help is what I think of the building blocks. So there are okay. these building blocks that Nephi has. They're kind of the primary story building blocks of scripture. And Isaiah isn't going to go back and reteach them. He's just going to say, that's that building block. Or a better way to say it would be like a hyperlink. Okay. So he's going to hyperlink, you know, when you see a squiggly blue line on a web page and click to it and it zings you over to the page. Yeah. He's just going to refer to those. So he's going to use these building blocks or these hyperlink ideas, assuming you already know what they are. Yeah. Um, So he's going to talk about covenants and he's going to talk about a couple of them. He's going to talk about the one with Abraham and us. I will never leave you as a family. You are mine forever. That is the Abrahamic covenant. Yeah. Right. Yeah. So just like you talked about with Adam. And I often will say there is no Abrahamic covenant without Sarah. It's, it's the parents, right? Or yeah. there's a husband and wife. Yeah. And it's like, it's the whole covenant to all of us. And exactly. to them and the nations, yes. right? Exactly. So it's like, I will, if, if I think of the Abrahamic covenant, I can do all those complicated priesthood and stuff. But if I boil any covenant down, yeah. I will never leave you. Right. Like a marriage. I'm going to bond with you that no matter how far you fall, yeah. I am there when you turn back around. Yeah. Right. So he does that. Israel, Lori, Barb, I will never leave you. He's also like, I will help you get out of these problems. Now, he's talking about some political problems, so they promise a king, someone who's going to come, and that's the Savior. So 2 Samuel 7, he's going to say, there's a Messiah that's going to come. There's this Messiah that's going to come. There's this line of David, this Jesse, this king, anything in that. Those are all hyperlinks to that idea. Right. So ideas about the covenant, ideas about kingdom, right? Ideas about one day judgments coming. It's called the day of the Lord, right? Yeah, yeah. So he's going to say the day, the great day, the day of the Lord, judgment. It's coming, right? Yeah. Right? Naughty day. I'm taking you out to the woodshed. <laughs> it's day. coming. Okay. Yeah, yeah, well, that's, you know, what I would add as a kid. But but he's going to refer to those. Those ideas, and there's, there are many more. The temple. The temple's on a mountain. The temple's in the Garden of Eden. The temple is in the temple. The temple's in the tabernacle. Any of those references? Temple. Yeah. So he's going to keep hyperlinking to these ideas. And so you're like, oh, that's one of those. <laughs> that's yeah, one of those. Yeah. And you're like, oh, I kind of know that one. I kind of know that one. Otherwise, you're like, what is he talking about? Right? What is he talking about? So there, there are a few of those building blocks, but I would do that covenant, um, day of the Lord, meaning kind of judgment, yeah. uh, 
especially for those that might deserve it. And sometimes we want people to get their just desserts, right? Well, President yeah. Nelson has said that to us recently, right? I mean, yeah. there is a day of judgment for every person. It's a good reminder that it's coming. It is coming. Yep. Yeah. And then we have ideas of the Messiah who's coming, the king who will bail us out of this giant mess we've made of our civilization. Yeah. And don't we worry about, you know, it's election year. So, <laughs> you know, we worry about that stuff. And he's like, there's a guy who can take charge. So those are just a few of them. There are a lot more. But I think those building blocks, when we jump in, you know the poetry, you know it's emotive, you can try some other tools like another translation. It's going to teach about Christ and hope, theme of judgment and hope, but it also is going to say, don't forget those little hyperlinks. Yeah. And that can really help as you jump through here. Here's one more. Yeah, please. Take it slow. Don't try to read this like a story. Take it like you know, a really delightful meal where you're going to sit down and you're just going to work on a section and really enjoy it. So take this section of Isaiah where he's in six and he sees the Lord, holy, 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 and then say, where else do I know holy? Oh, it's written on the side of the temple. What does that mean? Right? Enjoy it. Slow down. Look yeah. up other terms. Think of other examples. You don't have to know everything about Isaiah. You just have to take one thing that you can apply. Could you put those in a little bit of an order for us as yeah. we're kind of finishing up? So give us these tools, this very succinct bullet points. Yeah, so the first thing is context. Remember okay. that Nephi picked these things particularly to teach us. In 2 Nephi 11, he outlines a few of those few he wants you to know, that it's the Savior and his covenants, right? Okay. There are a yep. few more, but usually there. So you're going to start with context. Okay. And that's the context. The second is there are two themes, judgment always coupled by hope. Okay. And so you're going to say, is this judgment or is this hope, right? Is, it, right. is, is this what this story is about? Third, the style that it's written in is poetry. So as we look at the poetry, remember it's dense, it's short, it doesn't rhyme, but the ideas do, and almost the entire thing is written in poetry. So it helps to just slow down and take those. Um, last, it's about the Savior coming into our lives. So apply it. Yeah. Try it out and see, just like we've done with your stories. Thank you for sharing. And yours. Thank you for sharing. Yeah, you and uh, driving your car, clearly, is the other message that we yes, <laughs> need to be driving more. Really revelation in our cars. <laughs> um, and then I think you can learn Isaiah. I think when you think of those spiritual stories in your life, you say, I, I know those. I understand them. Yeah. That means you can understand Isaiah. Yeah, and I think that's one of the beauties of this is, as we're trying to understand it, this, the story and the feeling and the spirit still speaks to us. But as you are saying, the more we pay the price, we slow down, we understand the poetry and things, then it can even get deeper into where we are, yep. deeper into where we need to be. The, 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 the closer we draw to the Savior, the more we understand him, right? Yep. And I think this helps us. The more we understand Isaiah, the more we understand the Savior as and well. That's all Nephi wants to say. Yeah. Remember those moments. You too can see him too, just like us. Lord, there are a number of verses in here that we could talk about with this about the Savior, and I would love to have you maybe just share one if you could. I want to share one of my favorites. Okay, you is that start, okay? and then we'll jump yeah, to mine. I'll end. Deal. So this is chapter nineteen, okay. verse six, and this is a this is a famous Isaiah verse. But I have I have loved this. I always will. It says, "For unto us unto us a child is born, unto us a son is given, and the government shall be upon his shoulder." And his name shall be called Wonderful, Counselor, the Mighty God, the Everlasting Father, and the Prince of Peace. I, I, I recognize we have a song. We, we, ha we talk about this so often. But I, I love the understanding here, especially in our day, of how God is a counselor. He's everlasting. Again, he will never leave us. And then this Prince of Peace. And so much craziness in this world today that we have the Savior of the world who is the Prince of Peace. I love that piece. Yeah. I'm going to quote something similar. It's uh, chapter 2 Nephi 17, and it's 14. The Lord himself shall give you a sign. Behold, a virgin shall conceive, and shall bear a son, and shall call him his name Emmanuel. And that name, God with us. Yeah. If anything I want you to know is that he's going to come, he's going to be just like you, and he's going to be with you. And that gives me hope. Lori, thank you so much. What a, what a great verse to share with us. Elder Packer often has a question that he asks, which is simply, therefore what? So I want to ask you the question after this entire discussion, and thank you again for all that you have explained and helped us to see, therefore what? Uh, go forth and enjoy Isaiah, right? You can do it. <laughs> so if I encourage anybody, it's like, we already know this stuff. We're powerful women of covenant. We're powerful people of the covenant. We can go and do this stuff. 
and then we can be like Isaiah. He goes out and shares it, right? This yeah. is when he becomes prophet. We, we might be the prophet, but we can be the sharers. We can be the gatherers. So we take that thing that we've learned. We, we enjoy it. We love it. We now relish it. And then we can go out and we share it. And I think that's part of the message of Nephi. Well, go save the message, share the message of the Savior with everyone. Beautiful. Thank you. We started talking about President Eyring and how he is inviting us to learn, as Lori has just taught us, about the study of Isaiah. So thank you for that. We've also been reminded by President Eyring to apply these scriptures and to liken these scriptures to ourselves. So we invite you to now apply these principles of the gospel of Jesus Christ. Be confident in your ability to study Isaiah and also to teach these doctrines and principles to those that you have stewardship over or responsibility over in some way continue to reach out. Thank you so much for gathering with us today, and we hope to see you next week as well. Thank you.